Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Paris, city of light, city of gaiety, city of scintillating women, sparkling wine, and the finest food in the world. But this has not always been so. Just a few years ago, Paris was a city of darkness and despair and hunger, where men turned to strange and sinister activities just to keep alive. This was the Paris of the Nazi occupation, a hopeless city, which Marcel Aimee has caught in his strangely disturbing story, Crossing Paris, a tale of cupidity and retribution. Listen. Listen, then, to Mr. Hans Conried starring in Crossing Paris, which begins... In exactly one minute. Smoke Kent, smoke Kent, smoke Kent with the micronite filter. And in the mild, mild cigarette that's got the freshest, cleanest taste yet. It is the mild Kent cigarette, smoke Kent with the micronite filter. to keep you in suspense. If you had been in Paris during the Nazi occupation, you would have seen a lot of interesting things. You might even have caught a glimpse of me stealing through the streets at night as inconspicuously as possible for a man carrying a heavily loaded valise in each hand. These valises were lined inside with canvas to prevent the leakage of any telltale drops of blood. And they belonged to my employer, Monsieur Jean Blier, in whose cellar the original butchering was accomplished. My job was hard, but it paid well for the risks I took. Quite often I worked with an assistant carrier, usually Le Tambo. Well, one winter afternoon, I set out to meet Le Tambo at the Café Voltaire on the boulevard de la Bastille. It was bitterly cold, and the trees were bright with frost. It promised to be a miserable night for us. A keen north wind was blowing over the canal toward the Seine, and the day seemed dying of cold. It was nearly dark when I reached the Café Voltaire. Ah, Pierre, what will it be? You look cold enough for a brand. <laughs> that I am. <laughs> Here, this will warm your bones. Your friend Le Tambo is in. He said to tell you he is not free tonight. Oh, curse him. How can he behave like that? He has no respect for his work. Respect for what work? Who is this Le Tambo? Respect for what oh, work? Oh, please, monsieur. Oh, please. I'm talking to the bartender. It's no affair of it's yours. It's my affair, all right. I'm standing here drinking, and you come in and curse people and talk about respect. I'll teach you respect. Oh, the fellow was drunk. He put his glass down and staggered up to me, fist raised. At that same moment, a huge man calmly stepped around from behind me, caught the drunk's chin in his big hand, and pushed him back with a powerful thrust. I get it, I get it now. The police always travel in Now, we are not the police, you idiot, but I promise you some police if you don't shut up. I thought, look at the brute. He has police written all over him. And I was honest. Well, well, then, uh, let's go, my lad. Pay for our drinks now, and we'll report to the station for duty. Pay up and let's be off. I don't know why, but I paid. And then, still laughing, the big one took me by the arm and we started out. He was a, a rough fellow, probably a laborer, but certainly not of the police, dressed as he was in a spotted, shiny suit and a dark turtleneck sweater. His small, pig-like eyes were bright with irony, and the tight blonde curls that ringed his huge head gave him the appearance of a, a great ram. 
When we reached the street, the night was already black with high, icy winds. That was a squalid scene. Oh, well, the man was drunk. But I could have handled him. I, I carry a knife, you know. You did not have to interfere. Oh, no, I enjoyed it. Well, anyway, you, you probably saved him from being cut up. Oh, but I didn't realize that you were going to cut him. My apologies, monsieur. <laughs> You're a bloodthirsty brute. I bet your wife wears a black eye to mass every Sunday. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, wife. The big thing in times like this is to eat. With me, my stomach comes first. Love afterwards. <laughs> I see. And what do you do? What is your train? Huh? I am a, a painter. Oh, you must find it difficult these days. There's so little building going on. I manage in a small way. Uh, look here. Uh, you're a strong fellow, and if you're not afraid of a little risk, uh, I can give you a job tonight as my assistant. It uh, pays well, too. How much? Say, uh, 400 francs. You're on. Don't you even want to know what it is? Well, you're probably an assassin. <laughs> of course not. Above all, I'm a man of honor. Uh, what difference does it make? All right, then. Let's turn off here. First, we must go to the Rue Polivaux. Our work starts there. Well, let's walk faster. I'm cool. Who is it? I, Pierre. Huh? Who's the other one? Let Humbo ducked out on me tonight. Oh. So I've asked my friend Grand Gilles here to take his place. Oh. He's all right. Hurry then, you're late. We followed Monsieur Jambier across the cellar to a thick table where stained white cloths covered a shapeless form. He proudly removed the shroud, revealing a whole hog which had been neatly cut into a dozen portions. Then he stood back and allowed us to feast our eyes. He's a beauty, no? Whew. How much does he weigh? 200 pounds. But divided into four valises, you'll manage them all right. <laughs> it's easy to see. You've never carried a hundred pounds of black market pig about Paris. You're wasting time. Hand me a valise under the table there. Where does it go tonight? To Montmartre. Butcher shop in the Rue Goulancourt, number 43. And one thing now. To arrange his deliveries, he must have the meat there by 2 a.m. If you are late, he will not accept it. But Montmartre... It's no distance for a young man like you... How much are you giving us? Now, Pierre, bargain's a bargain. We are all men of honor in this affair. No one has ever questioned my honor, monsieur. And I deliver your meat on this side of the Seine for 400 francs. But, Montmartre, that's a different matter. Oh, I see what you're up to. You know perfectly well I can't risk keeping the pig here and that it's too late to get anyone else to carry it. Lugging 200 pounds of black market meat all the way across Paris in the dead of the night with the police lying in wait for us at every turn along the way. You call that profiteering? All right, then. Oh. All right. You get uh, 50 francs more. I want respectable pay for my work, not just a tip. 500, then. But not a sou more. It is hard work. It involves great risk. 600 francs. Tell me, Monsieur Chamblier, is this really number 45? What? <laughs> Why do you ask that? <laughs> oh, for no reason at all. Because I know the answer. Monsieur Chamblier, 45, oui, pour Who is this man, Pierre? Frangil, you will do me the courtesy of keeping your mouth shut. I do the talking here. You agree, then, sir, to 600 francs? Monsieur Chamblier, 45, oui, pour My share will be a thousand francs. What? Are you mad? Oh, don't pay any attention to him. He's my assistant. So you just give me the two times. 600 francs, I'll settle with him later. All right, then. Huh. Here, take it. I can't have you here all night. Monsieur Jean-Blier, 45, oui, pour vous. Give me 2,000 francs. Or I shall wreck this place. Jean-Blier looked at him fearfully for a moment. Then he, he pulled a fat billfold from his pocket and handed two notes of a thousand francs each to the ram who pocketed them calmly and caught a third one on the fly when Jean-Blier, in his nervousness, let it slip. It was too much for me. I started to Gilles to make him return the money, but Jean-Blier seized me by the arm. Let him alone. 
I can't afford a row I here. don't want a row, but after all, he's my assistant. And this is my cellar. I've paid out enough money to have peace here at least. You can settle it with him later. Right now we've got to finish packing the valises. It's late. We went back to the table and finished fitting the sections of pork into the valises, wedging them in with crumpled newspapers. Grand Gilles paid no attention to us, but sat across the cellar on a wine barrel, eating a thick slice of ham he'd found. When we were packed, however, he got up without a word and came over to pick up his two valises. This apparent willingness seemed to impress Jambier, and when we reached the door, he stuck a pack of cigarettes into the ram's pocket. That's for the two of you, for the trick. Shh. Cigarettes at night? It's a fine way to get ourselves picked up. Oh, come now, Pierre. Don't worry so much. I have to have 2,000 francs more. No, no, no. Not a sou. Not a single sou. Give me 2,000 francs, for heaven's sake, Jamblier. Jamblier. 2,000 francs, Jamblier. Don't be stupid. You'll have the police on us. Here, you blackmailer. Here, take them. But shut up. In the name of Mary, shut up. Here, you devil. Open the door. Let us get out of here. I'll settle with you later, my fine friends. Jamblier. Oh, Jamblier. I now have to have another 2,000. Oh, quiet, I tell you. Stop it. No, don't you dare pull anything like that again. What's the matter with you anyway? Do you want to go to jail? I'm warning you now. If you ever... Stop chirping at me or I'll pinch your head off and let you bleed. Well, I don't want any trouble, but after all, I've given you a job. This is my work. You should have some respect for it. Oh, that's for your job. Where do we cross the river? We have to go up to the Ile Saint-Louis, to near the railway station down here, to many... Police patrols and German soldiers are on. Let's hurry, then. My hands are turning to stone. As we pass by the wine market, deserted and desolate in the night, the wind seemed to blow with less violence, but colder. Our faces were gnawed and burned by it. The oily water in the Seine was black as coal, and along the banks the bare trees stood bleak and spectral. Finally, we reached the Ile Saint-Louis, and with a cord, turned into the first side street for a moment's respite from the paralyzing north wind. It's a wonder the air doesn't feel. Why in the name of heaven do you work at this job? I make my living this way. Every man to his trade. Now tell me, how much can you get for pork in the black market, huh? Forget it. What, 75 francs a pound? Forget it, I tell you. In that cafe where they thought we were police? I'm sure we could sell Jean Blier's pig at 75 francs a pound. That would give us 30,000 francs. 15,000 a piece of easy money, so instead of killing ourselves in this wind... You think if I want to do that, I'd have brought you along? No, and if I were to decide to do it now, I'd begin by getting rid of you. What makes you think you... Be quiet. Listen. A patrol. Back here in the shadows. Quick. In a moment, we continue with Suspense. Jack Benny acquires a girls' baseball team, and Armis Brooks acquires headaches from a school board on CBS Radio this evening. And if that isn't enough, Mitch Miller has Jack Webb hiding under his beard. Yes, there's great listening ahead on CBS Radio, so keep your dial right where it is. Suddenly aware of the fact that his rivals, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, are part owners of baseball teams, Jack Benny will be out to acquire one for himself, and the answer will be the Buxom Bloomer Girls. For another key to laughter, join Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks, as she tries to open Madison High in time to receive an award for good attendance. The key here is the one she loves in a series of mishaps that prevent the opening of the school. Too late to help her find the key, but in time to help Mitch Miller present one of his greatest shows, Jack Webb will be here on most of these same stations, along with producer Otto Preminger and comedian Phil Foster. Remember, they're all on CBS Radio later today. Jack Benny, Eve Arden, and Mitch Miller with his guests, Jack Webb, Otto Preminger, and comedian Phil Foster. And now, we continue with Crossing Paris, starring Mr. Hans Conried. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. We froze against the doorway and the patrol passed without seeing us. 
Ahead of us were still two solid hours of terror crossing Paris. The moon was still hidden, but the night had grown lighter and consequently more dangerous for us. After a block or two, I, I suddenly sensed that Gilles was no longer behind me, and turning, I saw him halfway across the street, headed toward a line of blue light that framed the doorway of a cafe. I'm going to get a shot of liquor. Come back here, you fool. You can't carry that stuff in there. I won't be long. He was already opening the door, pushing his valises past the blackout curtain which masked the lighted interior. Cursing, not telling what he was up to now. But in any event, I couldn't leave him there with jean Pierre's pork, and I didn't dare stand around in the street waiting for him. So I crossed over and followed him inside. <laughs> Several men who looked like clerks were playing cards at a table. And the floor was covered with sawdust and the lights were dingy. The proprietor's wife sat knitting a sock behind the cash register and looking suspiciously at Grangine, who was already standing at the bar, one foot resting on his valises. Two cognacs, patron. This is my closing time. Cognac. What is all that luggage? You are not running into my place with the police at your heels, are you? Give us some cognac. No, 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 no. Do not cause a row with me. These rows... Cognac, patron, Rémi, Martin. Shut up, Grangy. Shut up, what? I tell you. Eh bien, if you quiet down, I will get it for you. Thank you, monsieur. The proprietor searched for a bottle of Rémi Martin, and Grangy turned and stared at the four clerks who had stopped their card game. They were obviously avoiding so much as a glance in our direction. All right. You. There are four of you sitting there. You're half starved on rotten carrots and sawdust pudding. You're smoking corn silk. All of you. And there's enough good fat pork in these valises to make you rich. Huh? What's to keep you from making off with it? You know well enough we're in no position to report it. In the name of heaven, Grangy, come to your senses. Get out of here, you filthy paupers. Get out. Uh, and howl uh, against uh, the black market. Uh, Rabble! Uh, scum! Uh, what good does it do to make laws if they're not respected? Uh, Blackguards! Uh, anarchists! Disloyal Frenchmen! Stop it, Grangy. Have you lost your mind? Perhaps you don't care what happens to you, but I care what happens to me. You don't say so, eh? You there, patron, patron, patron. I can't wait all night. Give us some cognac. Give us some cognac, I said. Here is your cognac. But please, no more. It is past closing time already. Uh, here. Here's to you, little Pierre. You who are as timid as a girl, but whose charm I cannot resist. Your valises full of pork that these cowards refuse to take, I will carry as far as Le Havre, on foot, on my knees, for you. And then, without warning, the ram reached out, seized the cognac bottle, and eased it with all his strength against the mirror behind the bar. Ah, excellent, excellent. Now, my valises. Come, little Pierre, I never wish to see these wretched people again. Baboons! I ignore you. I erase you from my memory forever. I followed him out, wondering how in the world I could keep this monstrous madman from getting us picked up by the police. The moon had come out now, and the center of the street looked like an arrow of brightness, while the shadows along the sidewalk offered dangerous possibilities of surprise. At the first street crossing, the black shadow in which we were walking was broken by a streak of moonlight. We just reached the opposite curb when, from the dark, only three yards in front of us, a man's voice rang out. Stand where you are. No tricks now. What are you carrying in those valises? Before taking that tone, you'd do well to identify yourself. It's the police. You saw me well enough. Oh, the police? Well, I'm suddenly glad we ran into you. I've been looking for somebody to show us how to get to the Rue Sévigny. You're going away from it, and I think that you... You don't tell me. Did you hear that, my friend? The Rue Sévigny is behind us. Well, then we just have to turn back. Later, perhaps. Right now, you're going with me to the station. May we rest a moment first? We've walked a long way looking for the Rue Sévigny. Perhaps I can explain. No need for that. Come along now. Come on. There was nothing he could do if I put my valises down anyway, in spite of him. So I did thinking he would give me a chance to talk him out of this 
And the ram, bending his knees slightly, put his down also. And then, suddenly straightening up, smashed the policeman's jaw with his <laughs> fist. The poor man doubled to his knees, fell flat without making a sound. Grangil bent over him for a moment and then grabbed his hat and threw him into the middle of the street. The visor shone there in the moonlight. Well, let's go. Well, that was clever. As soon as he comes to, he'll grab his whistle. In five minutes, all the police in the arrondissement will be after us. That would surprise me. I have this whistle in my pocket. Air raid alert. Now what will we do? We don't dare go into a shelter with this meat. And we certainly can't stay in the streets. I live only two blocks from here. Come on. Come on. In spite of carrying a hundred pounds apiece of that cursed pig, we ran all the way. But at last, with resting lungs, we made it. I stopped a moment inside the door to catch my breath before climbing to the top floor where he said he lived. The ram went on ahead and the door was open when I finally arrived. Come in. Come in. I'll have a fire going in the stove in a moment. It was a large, comfortable studio. In the bluish light that filtered in from the street, I could see a huge mirror covered with gauze hanging directly opposite the entrance over a baby carriage filled with what appeared to be framed paintings. I set down my valises near the door and stood there until Grand Gilles drew a blackout curtain over the window and turned on the light. There were several easels in the room, and on a table near the window were spread out a number of drawings and paintings. Surprise? You're a painter. Yes. I said I was. You did all those? I sell most of them around Montmartre. But since the German occupation, musically enough, not all was for money. I bought her. Well, only last week, for a picture of a woman wearing nothing but high-heeled shoes and an opera hat, I got a ham. But here's one I've been commissioned for that'll bring a hundred thousand francs. You like it? No. Because it's the portrait of a Nazi? Perhaps. And because it's no good. <laughs> You're still angry with me, aren't you? Oh, I don't know what to think of you. Think what you like, then. I'm going to eat something. The stove had commenced to glow, so I sat down in a big, easy chair next to it and soon became drowsy in its pleasant warmth. And then suddenly a bell went off and woke me out of a sound sleep. Grand Gilles speaking. Ah, Susie. Oh, I'm sorry I couldn't make it. Pierre Martin and I were... Huh? No, no, you don't know him. <laughs> But Pierre Martin is a little gutter snipe who works in the black market. He gave me a job, the poor idiot. Oh, a great one. Wore dirty clothes, played the role of a tough, a satanist, a thief. No, no, no. It was very easy. After all, it's the weak ones who act tough. Very amusing, I assure you. What? Huh? No, no, I'm still an amateur. So that's it. I'm Slamming. not you about it he all. Was it was mocking you. me, making yeah. fun of my work. <laughs> Laughing to himself, all the... I'll show him. Oh, the... Pierre, Pierre, such temper, little one. You dog. And I thought you were hard up. I want to help you. And you, the gentleman, treating himself to a, a taste of what I suppose you call the underworld, like a stinking tourist. Is there a reward out for you, Pierre? It's stealing, that's what it is. You should have left the work to a man who needed it. You have no honor, no respect for work, you... Filthy rat! Oh, but I have, I have. Come over here. Look, I drew a portrait of you while you slept. Huh? Perhaps you will like this picture. I don't even want to look at it. What do you think I am? Me, I earn my keep, I work hard. You and you Nazi under a thousand franc commission, you've done everything to make trouble for me. My work is amusing, eh? Well, I'll show you what I think of you. Here, here, what are you up to? I ran across the room to the easel that held the portrait of the Nazi, plunged my knife into the car and ripped down. I was about to slash it across the middle when Grand Gilles, whose body smashed into me, and covered it to the floor. He had me by the throat and was slowly choking the life out with his thick fingers. I began to beat on the floor in agony with my open hand when suddenly I stuck the knife with one hand and seized it. My eyes were turning back in my head as I slashed out of his wrists. Ah! Oh! He let out a hole and sat back, watching the blood drip from one hand. I was too weak to move, so I lay there, holding my knife over my chest, pointing it at him. Suddenly, his eyes went white with insane rage, and before I could move, he threw himself on top of me again. Rolled over with a faint moan. My knife. I'd been driven straight into his heart. His legs twitched a little, and then he 
He lay still. I looked at him. Unbelievingly. I, I never healed. I never wanted to kill any man. Then I... I covered my face with my hands and... I wept. Two hours later, faint with exhaustion, I delivered all four valises to the butcher shop in Omar. All right, I waited. It is all there. Of course it is. I'm a man of honor, monsieur. I can see that. Yeah. And you made it on time, too. But uh, did you not have an assistant? I understood from Jean Blier. Oh, it seems that my assistant, monsieur, did not really need the work. I was, I was forced to dismiss him. Hmm. Well... Anyway, you made it. I always finish any job I start, monsieur. It was only then that I remembered that Grand Gilles had said my name to his girl over the phone and that my portrait sat waiting for the police in his studio. I put the 5,000 francs, which I'd taken from his body, into an envelope I borrowed from the butcher and addressed it to Jean Blier. I dropped it into a mailbox and then walked slowly down to the big market of Le Halle. It was almost dawn when I reached it, and the heavily loaded push carts were stacked up in the side streets, smelling of green vegetables and berries. The gutters were slippery with garbage, and a, a lonely woman in pink satin pumps was staggering wearily through the filth at the end of an all-night house. I sat down on a curb... And I watched her and said to myself, Believe me, we none of us do what we wish to do. Hans Conrad starred in Crossing Paris, adapted by John Meston, from the story by Marcel Aimee, and produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Listen. Listen again next week, when we return with Mr. Vincent Price in The Green and Gold String, another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Supporting Mr. Conrad in Crossing Paris were John Daner, Joe DeSantis, Ted DeCorsia, and Paul Dubov. Mm -hmm.